So this is the last lecture for this course and um, a little different perhaps from the, the previous lectures. Instead of focusing now on an author uh, that might represent or not a social movement, we are going to talk on this, um, on this lecture um, about a social movement, um, a Mexican, well, I shouldn't say Mexican because it's debatable whether they are uh, only Mexican, uh, but it's a group of indigenous people that reside in the uh, southern area of Mexico. Um, they've been together since 1994, this political group, and they started their work in with indigenous people, uh, a very diverse uh, group of indigenous people that reside in the area of Chiapas. So we call them Zapatistas and their logo is Peace with Dignity and Respect. I'm interested in this movement because I feel that somehow it pulls together many of the different uh, readings that we've had and the different theories that we've been looking at I think it draws uh, both from Marxism and anarchism and even some notions of liberalism are in there. I think they also uh, take a lot out of uh, thinkers like Gloria Saldúa and even thinkers like Malcolm X and uh, uh, very much from Nietzsche, believe it or not, uh, not directly from Nietzsche perhaps, but through the work of Michel Foucault who somehow comes and, and introduces a lot of uh, modifications into social theory, in making a big thing about uh, the need to diversify the struggles and to understand that capitalism operates on us as subjects of this power and not just through the economics of it, but also through our cultural traits, the way that we think about gender, sexuality, uh, that nations are built on uh, this capacity that states have to control all of our energies, uh, not just the possibility of us to go to work for a corporation or for ourselves, but also how we marry, who we can marry, who we cannot marry, um, you know, uh, what's good for the children, what's not good for the children, all of that stuff comes into play when you think about how you build power. So I use the example of the Zapatistas in Chiapas as a way of trying to pull together many of the different uh, things that we've been thinking out throughout the course. Um, so a film that I would recommend, uh, Zapatista by Big Noise Film, great, um, great film about the Zapatistas uprising early on. So you're not going to see much of the development. Um, they're mostly looking at what happened, uh, what led them to have a successful insurrection. So uh, we hear for the first time as a, as a public about the Zapatistas on January 1st, 1994. Uh, they had been organizing this political group for over 10 years, but it was all underground. And we only hear about them uh, when they take over several towns in Chiapas, including the capital city of this Mexican state. It's the biggest state in Mexico, by the way, and they control over 40% of it. Uh, so they take over San Cristóbal de las Casas, Ocosingo, Las Margaritas, and other towns in the area. They liberate all the prisoners. They set fire to the police station and to army garrisons as a way of uh, stopping um, the army and the police from repressing them. You should know that that uh, there have been many, many indigenous insurrections in Mexico, and all of them were repressed by the state before we could even hear about them. So this is a very unusual situation that we see in 1994. It was scheduled on that day because that's the day that the NAFTA, this free trade agreement that Trump hates, uh, went into effect. Um, while the corporations of Mexico or, or the Mexican located corporations uh, were interested in NAFTA. NAFTA was actually a disaster, uh, especially for the campesinos, for the people who work the fields in Mexico. And the Zapatistas, as I mentioned, uh, is a group of political people that uh, came into contact with these indigenous folks, most of them Mayans, so this NAFTA agreement was a, a terrible thing for them, and they protest that by taking over all of these towns. Now, the most interesting thing for me 
of uh, this successful uh, uprising is the fact that we found out about what was going on on that same day, even those of us who had never heard about them. And this includes myself. I was an activist and an organizer in social movements for a long time, so I have plenty of contacts with people all over the world who are interested in social change, but I had never heard of the Sabatistas themselves. But that morning when I woke up, uh, I found an email in my inbox that told me that a group of indigenous people had taken over the uh, capital city of Chiapas and they were trying to avoid uh, heavy repression if I could please contact the president of the country and a number of other uh, phone numbers and, and contacts that were made available to me. Uh, this, in my view, uh, made a whole difference uh, with the way that the government was able to deal with them. They were heavily repressed, but the Catholic Church in the area, a progressive Catholic Church um, that we uh, think of as um, Third World Theology uh, Church, uh, they were able to enact a ceasefire with the state. And this was just because there was so much international pressure immediately after the uprising. So this is a characteristic of this, uh, what we call this postmodern revolution, that they do not only rely on their own local forces, but they were very well organized ahead of time to create a social global network of solidarity. If you think of uh, globalization and how it affects populations throughout the world in different countries, sometimes the same ethnicity is exploited in sweatshops in China, for example, and in sweatshops in the United States. The fact that this political group of indigenous people were able to come up with a, a, a way of uh, insurrecting that took into account globalization and put pressure on this country through a global network is just something that you have to admire the genius of them. Uh, so more information on NAFTA, if you click on that link that I put up in the PowerPoint, you'll see more information about this trade agreement that uh, was so bad for the, um, mostly for the, not only the working class people, but mostly for the people who work the fields in Mexico. So what happened immediately after the initial uprising from January 2 to 12, the National Army moved in with helicopters and heavy artillery and the Zapatistas have to retreat to the jungle and they suffer heavy losses. So when you watch those videos, beware that you will see indigenous people's bodies there and some horrendous images of, of death. Uh, but as I mentioned before, um, the uh, theology liberation bishop Samuel Ruiz is able to negotiate a ceasefire uh, against the background of this enormous international pressure that had been put in place ahead of time. So the Zapatistas, through this negotiation and this resistance to the um, to those to these two days of heavy repression, are able to retain the liberated land, which is, as I said, uh, uh, most of the territory of the biggest state in Mexico. Uh, so a year later, in '95, the army breaks a ceasefire and attacks the Zapatista villages. And again, the Zapatistas have to run into the jungle, abandon their villages, and just uh, survive their best they can. But the military is not able to seize the main leaders of the organization, so the insurrection continues. And eventually, the ECNL, uh, in order to stop this uh, constant uh, harassment from uh, the state of Mexico, uh, starts organizing what they call the International Encuentros in the Jungle. Uh, so this gave rise to the People's Global Action Network work the PGA which is a, a group of uh, a group of groups of many uh, anarchists autonomists and marxists around the world organizers who are interested in uh, a, a different way of globalizing the world that is not necessarily uh, built on the backs of people who uh, cannot uh, do otherwise like the uh, people who work the lands of Mexico or like the immigrants that we see drowning every day in the Mediterranean Sea. So they are looking for a way of globalizing the world that is not just good for corporations, but it's actually good for the majority of the people, for the 99%.
is so uh, jumping ahead um, in the year 2000, the Zapatistas realized that they have two ongoing problems uh, and both of them are connected with issues of power. Uh, we looked at the insurrections uh, of Cuba and we looked at the calls of Marx and we must have noticed that these are calls for centralized kind of governance with a strong political party, with leadership and a vanguard that is highly educated and makes decisions uh, for the masses of people in the, um, in the country that made the revolution until supposedly these masses, um, um, you know, like, um, grow out of their education under capitalism and are able to develop a new subjectivity that will be the subjectivity that will uphold these revolutionary communities, a subjectivity that necessarily needs to leave aside uh, any kind of um, uh, self-interest and just work for the interest of the community. So because that takes a long time, these vanguards of highly educated people in political parties usually do the thinking and the ruling for these folks. And that, as we've seen in the Soviet Union and also up to a certain point in Cuba, doesn't always end up in the best possible way. So the Zapatistas realized that the army were most of the intellectuals of this revolution are active in is uh, having a lot of power over the campesinos in the communities, over the poor indigenous people that constitute their territory, their base, if you want. Uh, so they decide to implement uh, governments that are only civilian so that they can counter uh, uh, attack the power of the Zapatista army over the communities. Uh, so um, this is another reason why we call it a, a postmodern revolution because they are uh, dealing with the issue of power, uh, trying to decentralize this power structure in order to avoid the bureaucratization and uh, ultimately uh, exploitation uh, by the bureaucracy in Russia, for example, in the Soviet Union against their own people. So they established this autonomous government, eh, but also thinking of the many problems that um, bureaucracies generated in the communist countries, they set up a, a system that these governments don't last in power more than two weeks. So there's a constant renewal of these uh, governments and people are not paid to be in those positions. So uh, they really want to go back home and take care of their lands rather than be in government, which solves the issue of, um, you know, that we see in Western democracies where we elect uh, somebody into power and then they do whatever they want in Washington and we never hear about them until the next election. Uh, so this is a way that they dealt with that situation. Um, the other reason why they create all these autonomous communities and governments is because they want to be able to um, distribute the international support that they receive from many NGOs in Europe and the United States and other countries of the world uh, so that it's evenly distributed amongst the communities. Otherwise, before uh, people with a lot of power and money would make friends with certain communities and these communities would get a lot of support, but then the communities down the road that were also Zapatistas and also indigenous would starve. So by creating these autonomous governments, they are able to distribute uh, resources that come from abroad in a more equitable way and uh, create less frictions amongst the communities and also uh, put a, a, a stop to the power of the uh, intellectually um, powerful army that they created. Uh, also in this year, the year 2000, they write the sixth declaration of the Lacandon Django uh, calling for a broad coalition, uh, a broad global coalition again, because they are very, uh, very aware of that during uh, 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 times like this where globalization is so important, you cannot pretend that you're going to be able to hold on to power on your own. You need a global coalition. And they call for this global coalition to be established by people that are to the left and from the ground up. Um, <clears throat> We'll talk more about that later. And you have, uh, as part of your assigned readings for this class, uh, the, this declaration of the Lacandon jungle. Um, so um, Chiapas in context, so that we get an idea why uh, these people uprose. Um, it's the largest indigenous population in Mexico is located in the States. 
in the state of Chiapas, but it's also the population, and not surprisingly, because they are mostly indigenous and thus have been uh, uh, deprived from their own resources, where they have the highest rates of congenital malnutrition, infant and adult mortality of all of Mexico. Also, very high rates of illiteracy and things that are really heartbreaking and hard to believe the life expectancy in these indigenous communities is 44 years versus 70 years, which is a national average for Mexico outside of indigenous communities. Brutal, right? I mean, uh, 44 years old, I'm 58. That means that if I had been born in Chiapas, I would be dead now. So very powerful numbers, right? Also, 159 babies died, over 1,000 babies born, while in the rest of Mexico, it's 45 over 1,000. Uh, and finally, not surprisingly, again, because women are usually at the bottom of this uh, brutality uh, chains, half of the population uh, was malnourished at the time that they took over, and the girls being the most affected. And this is the part that I'm saying is not surprising, because in general, women are always more oppressed than men. Um, very interesting stuff to watch out. Watch uh, Zapatista women, a very interesting short video about them. It's a little childish, the presentation, I could say, because it's meant as an educational resource for children and not for adults, but I think it's worth watching. So another reason why we call this a, a post-structural, post-modern revolution is because it's what we uh, consider an autonomous movement, very different, although Marxist-oriented, very different from the movements that we saw, for example, the Che Guevara lead. Um, these folks are not aimed at state power. They are not interested in taking over the central government of Mexico, like, the, like Che Guevara and his friends did with the central power in Cuba. Um, they just think that the state does not serve them, that the state has abandoned the indigenous, so the indigenous should abandon the state of Mexico. So what they did is they created these autonomous communities that have self-governments and popular participation. And as I said, the governments are uh, renewed every two weeks, so there's no issue there of bureaucracy. Um, they also uh, employ other ways of listening to their people. Uh, one of th this is called lead by obeying. That means that the leadership is in the hands of folks who, who have been there for a long time and have been studying, you know, Marx and, and, and all the other uh, important authors that made, made a dent in the way that we think about social change. But at the same time, they, play, they pay very close attention to the desires of the community, which is something that was not present in the Soviet Union or Cuba because of this idea that uh, uh, people at the bottom, uh, people in the working class, usually uh, until they've been able to live in a non-capitalist uh, society, have the values and the interests of capitalism and not of communism or uh, socialism. So uh, these folks have a very different approach to that. They do realize that probably some of these ideas in the communities do stem from the hegemony of capitalist ideas in, in the world in general, but that there's also knowledge there. These are people have, that have been able to survive for over 500 years the exploitation of uh, of white um, white corporations, so uh, they listen. That's what they mean to by lead by obeying. Uh, and uh, something important for uh, what we study in this course is that they've been able to challenge, or I think I, they did, uh, the slave master dynamics that we mentioned in the Nietzsche classes. Uh, they do uphold perspectivism. Uh, they have this really long decision-making processes. Uh, they lead by obeying. Uh, they try to uh, avoid the creation of super people, of vanguards, of uh, of folks that are you know not not the regular, real, everyday folks, but just create a community that will be strong and with values that they can all share. So uh, by rotating their government every two weeks, they are making a huge effort here to try to stay out of this slave master dynamics so that 
most people in the community would be empowered rather than a few over uh, the many. So this connects with lead by obeying and it connects with the, the idea of autonomy and self-governance government and popular participation. Uh, and it does connect, in my perspective, with Marx's original ideas. Uh, while Marx talked about the dictatorship of the proletariat, as I mentioned, he also thought that uh, Western democracies, like what we know now, were uh, dictatorships of the of the uh, bourgeois. So I think that Marx's ideas for a society that would be free and where human beings could be free and be able to uh, become what they could uh, is not something that is completely against um, this, this ideas of the Zapatistas, but it is very different from the conceptions of Che Guevara and other folks that we haven't studied, like Lenin in the Soviet Union, for example, the first revolutionary in the Soviet Union in 1917. So uh, we call it the first postmodern, postcolonial revolution, as I said, and this is where I think Marxism meets the other person, no, right? This idea of Nietzsche, of somebody who will strive to be a better person without oppressing others, and at the same time, somebody who understands that uh, the economy is important, but not the only piece in, in the construction of power. So um, they, they hold what we call a community-oriented subjectivity. As I mentioned in other classes, um, subjectivity is different from identity in the sense that we understand, those of us who use the concept of subjectivity, we understand that um, it, it's uh, less of a, of a fixed deal A subjectivity. is what we develop in our dance with the state, in our dance with power in general, and it can be changed and it can be modified. So uh, this is the, the, the project of the Zapatistas is creating this community-oriented subjectivity based on Marxism, yes, but also on this uh, indigenous knowledge that the people of Chiapas have held uh, for generations. So uh, we see this as a result of a symbiosis of indigenous culture and what I call, and many call, post-structural Marxism. This Marxism that has been strongly influenced by Michel Foucault and by other authors, some contemporary examples of uh, post-structural Marxist authors, aside from the Sabatistas who do publish books, and uh, I would encourage you to read more than what I assign if you're interested, uh, one, uh, one very famous one is Silvia Federici, Silvia Federici, the author of Caliban and the Witch, She's a post-structural Marxist, um, and she's somebody who supports very much the idea of revolutions uh, like the Zapatistas have done in Mexico. Um, so their interest is to create a world where there's uh, the possibility of having many diverse ways of being in the world and not just one way of being in the world. But again, this is always against the background of uh, oppression, uh, they do call for diversity, but they call from diversity from the ground up and to the left. So they wouldn't be interested in a diversity that would mean, for example, expressions of white supremacy. They wouldn't consider this a, a kind of diversity that would help them build this new power that they're working on. So uh, something that we usually don't mention very, very, um, very emphatically is that um, liberation theology, this Catholic um, Catholic trend within uh, Catholicism uh, that uh, really works with people who are poor and dispossessed has a huge impact on the way that the Zapatistas organize. And I think there's almost like a dual power in the communities um, that you feel if you visit there and you stay there for a while. I visited the Zapatistas communities in 2003, I think, or 2004, I can't remember, uh, but I didn't stay long enough there to watch this dynamics, but I've talked and read uh, from other people who were able to stay there for a longer time, and it seems like the village folks, um, the campesinos, the, the people who are less um, politically oriented, are very much influenced by Catholicism in the figure of liberation theology. 
Uh, while um, people who are more radical tend to join the Zapatista army where uh, the intellectuals that came from Mexico City are, are uh, active. Uh, there are obviously lots of indigenous people in the army as well, but uh, mostly it's those indigenous people that are interested in, um, less interested in religion and more interested in issues of uh, power and, uh, and, and uh, organization. So liberation theology stems from uh, the days of um, Fray Bartolomé de las Casas, who was one of the first uh, Catholic priests to arrive to um, the New World, as they call it, to the Americas. And he has been uh, credited for being one of the few, if not the only, uh, part of the colonizers who called for the end to the enslavement of the indigenous people. His argument was that the indigenous people were not able to hold this kind of brutality, and uh, which is true because they were dying uh, brutally. But unfortunately, um, he also recommended that uh, people from Africa were brought in to, do, to be slaves since they were able to do those jobs and, and sustain that kind of uh, brutality against them. It is said that uh, Bartolomé de las Casas uh, changed his mind later, uh, but there's not as much evidence of that as there is of his distinction between the indigenous and people from Africa. Um, so um, the Zapatistas function uh, mostly through the solidarity economy and uh, this means that the surplus value that Marx identified as that difference between what the worker takes home and what the worker produces, um, this surplus value stays within the community, not necessarily in people's pockets because they don't use uh, cash, they don't use money, but they do uh, keep the surplus value in the community. Um, so uh, we think that they co-created the anti-corporate globalization movement. You might have heard about us. I was uh, very uh, involved in that movement. I created many of the giant puppets that you see on the protests at the time. That movement came to an end in 2003 and it began uh, after the Zapatistas because of the impulse that the Zapatistas gave us. And it was very important in the United States uh, we did a lot of uh, aware, try to raise awareness around uh, trade agreements like NAFTA and other international trade agreements that were very bad for the working people in the United States, as we see now, out of those trade agreements is that we've had all this outsourcing that left our working class without jobs. Um, so this was one of the big uh, important um, um, contributions to social change. Um, they also received a lot of support from Western activists against state repression in Mexico. And uh, their workshops, because of these connections that they have internationally, are able to work outside of capitalist relations of production. That means that they don't have a boss, they don't have somebody who extracts uh, surplus value from them, but they uh, work in solidarity with each other through a very different way of organizing. You can see examples of this in different parts of the world, not necessarily in autonomous communities as big and developed as Chiapas, but in Argentina, for example, where um, Stepic organizes a semester abroad, uh, you can go and do an internship in factories that were taken over by workers in the year 2001, uh, when the economy collapsed and many factories were being fraudulently bankrupted, the workers took them over and they're still producing, they're selling for the for the market, only that now they are workers co-op and there's no corporate uh, money involved in the organization anymore. It was such a big deal that the government, and I'm still talking about Argentina, about the recovery factories in Argentina, the government uh, bought the factories from the owners, paid them, paid them back, and the uh, workers are buying the factory from the state uh, in small installments. Um, so uh, these are um, different ways of thinking about production and the economy, and we call this sometimes a solidarity economy because these projects are supported by organizations throughout the world that are more interested in having sustainable global trade rather than the so-called free trade that actually oppresses those who really have no freedom, like folks who work the land in Chiapas.
important concepts that the Zapatistas uh, use, walking questioning. Instead of uh, offering answers, they rather question and ask questions from the people that they work with in order to have the more nuanced vision of what's going on. They say that answers usually reproduce power domination, this idea that I was talking about before, the vanguard, right? The vanguard that knows best, which will tell you what to do in Cuba, for example, but sometimes, you know, that doesn't work quite well and people remain with uh, a different kind of subjectivity while the vanguard uh, advances on its own. So this is a situation of power domination over folks who you are supposed to uh, bring up to your own uh, status. In reality, it doesn't happen all that much. So, so that's why they call uh, for a coalition from the grass up and to the left in the sense that it doesn't come from above, from the intellectuals, from the middle class people that know better, but comes from the community itself and to the left in the sense that, yes, they are very clear about what they want. They don't want uh, to reproduce capitalism. That's not something that is good for indigenous poor people. They want to have a coalition that works with ideas that are somewhat based on Marxism, but not necessarily in an oppressive kind of Marxism. So because of this idea of fo uh, forming coalitions from the grass up and to the left, they call for all who are oppressed by bad governments uh, to join them. Uh, they consider bad governments pretty much all the governments in the world, except these uh, good governments that they set up, which are these governments that are renewable, every two weeks and are composed of indigenous people, people who are working their own lands, both women and men. It, so I'm not going to read all of this, but the situation of the women in Chiapas uh, has improved tremendously uh, under uh, capitalism. Their situation was so brutal that if you read carefully all these in uh, laws that they put together after the uprising, it breaks your heart, uh, what they uh, tell us of what they, their lives were like. Um, for example, one of the points is women have the right to be free of violence from both relatives and strangers. Women have the right to choose their partner and are not obliged to enter into marriage. Women should be able to have all the children they decide to have. So. Evidently, there was a, a, a situation of brutal uh, disempowerment of women, of brutal oppression of women, which the Zapatistas are making a huge effort to overcome. Uh, it doesn't happen all the time for them. Uh, there's still a lot of pullback, but they have been able to uh, empower many women. One of the issues that they have in the communities is that the women who are most radical tend to join the army and do not stay in the communities. So people who stay in the communities are a little less radical, which makes uh, the work of women's empowerment a little slower. There are many people in Chiapas and other places of the world studying the case of the women of Chiapas. Uh, Marga Lamillan has written wonderful work on their, on their lives. If you're interested, shoot me an email and I'll send you uh, her work. Some of it has been translated into English. Uh, so the Juntas de Buen Gobierno, I've gone through it a little bit already. Um, they are the campesinos themselves. They rotate every two weeks. Uh, there's both men and women uh, in it. And I emphasize this because in the past there wouldn't have been any women in it since women were so oppressed. Um, they were established to redistribute resources and to counterpower the uh, power of the army. Um, and uh, they... they I don't know, I always need to introduce like the critique, right? Um, when I visited there, I was very surprised to see that there were crates and crates and crates of Coca-Cola. Uh, so Coca-Cola, I don't know what it means for people here in the United States other than a, 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 a drink, but in Latin America, it's, uh, it's a terrible thing. Uh, in, in countries like Guatemala, for example, um, uh, the Coca-Cola Corporation does not allow for uh, workers to unionize and they routinely kill uh, union leaders. There's even songs about it, websites that call about uh, Coca-Cola's death squads, etc. So why would the Zapatistas drink this? Um, it's really um, one of those things that you say, well, how does that connect with autonomy? I think the reason is because they don't allow uh, for people to drink alcohol in the communities. 
that was one of the things that the women of Chiapas really wanted to stop was the alcoholism in the communities because they noticed that they were uh, more, even worse, their abuse increased if men were drunk. So they cannot buy alcohol in the community. So I think that you got to give them something, right? If you don't drink alcohol, are you only going to drink water? So uh, many activists against Coca-Cola have talked with the Zapatistas and have tried to get them to change this. And one of them went and talked with Marcos. Uh, Marcos is one of the most renowned leaders of the of the Zapatistas. Um, he has penned many of their books. Uh, he's one of the spokespeople for them. And Marcos said, well, okay, we got the issue. We understand what the problem is, and we have the solution. So the, this activist uh, asked her, well, ask him, well, what is the solution? And he said, we are going to drink it all. <laughs> anyway, um, Coca-Cola aside, the Zapatistas are still the object of lots of violence by the state and paramilitaries. In 2014, one of their schools was attacked and one of their teachers was killed, just to give you an example. So they are still very much on the edge of uh, of everything, but they have been able to exist uh, since 1994 as um, over, over the ground, above ground um, revolutionary movement, and they've been very successful. Um, this is a mural from one of the schools of the Zapatistas, and it's very important that it's a woman who's reading this book because women were not educated uh, in the past before the uprising. The book says, uh, it, autonomous education builds different worlds where many worlds can fit with very many different truths.